Well, hello everyone and welcome to my library. If you're new here, hello, my name is Chinsia. And if you're not new here, you're one of my lovely regulars. Hi, how are you? I hope you're doing splendidly. So I think you've probably noticed the length of this video. We are covering a lot in today's video for episode two of debunking the Atlantis myth. In this episode, I'm actually going to be focusing largely on deconstructing the details that are in Plato's extract in the Critias dialogue. And to do that, I'm taking us all the way to ancient Egypt, and we're going to be looking at different factors that may have played a role and answer some questions by, you know, shredding things apart. There may be certain parts of this video you may find interesting, so you may want to skip to them. There are chapters for that purpose. Or you may just want to sit yourself down, get yourself ready for a very, very, very long video, and just explore it with me with a cup of coffee or tea, or it's quite hot actually, so make sure you have a nice drink and drink some water. But before we get into today's video, I should actually take a moment to thank today's sponsor for making this very lengthy video possible, and that is Skillshare. Bullet journaling is great for productivity, and journal entries are great for processing, but what about when you want something creative and reflective? Well, it's time to try art journaling. Break out the collection of notebooks that you've been taking up an entire section of your bookshelf, and join YouTube star Amanda Rach Lee as she guides you through three art journaling exercises that she uses all the time in her personal journals. Whether you're an illustrator, a bujo maven, uh, a person with a washi tape collection that's getting a teeny bit out of control, or somewhere in between, Amanda's class is for the feelings in all of us, and can help you feel gratitude for your present and dream of your future. So if you're someone with a lot of ambition and you don't know where to prioritise your work, organise your thoughts and kickstart your career into gear, whether you're a wannabe researcher, creative entrepreneur, then this class and many others are on Skillshare. Skillshare can help you get your life on track and take it to the next level creatively, personally and professionally. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for anyone who loves learning and wants to explore their creativity and learn new skills. If you have a specific skill set you're trying to learn, then Skillshare is the perfect place to start. Whether you're making a career pivot or leveling up your skills, Skillshare is a great ad-free resource for freelancers, creatives and entrepreneurs to help them learn new skills and support their growing side hustles. What's more, new premium classes are added every week, so there's always a new dose of inspiration. If you're interested in joining the class I've recommended today, then the first 1,000 people who use my link or my code, Lady of the Library, will get one month free trial of Skillshare. So thank you so much Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. And now let's actually get into the meat of exploring Plato's Atlantis and Egypt. So in the last video, I had quite a few people, when I mentioned, you know, the sentence, you know, Atlantis isn't real. Many people believe that that was me saying that there's no such thing as any island or any factor of land uh, being affected by major climatic events, which isn't the same thing. And I would like to elaborate on this by saying, you know, just because I don't believe in Helios and Phaeton being real people does not mean that I don't believe that comets don't never hit the earth. And if you're curious, well, we're going down a discussion of, you know, mythology and a rather Robert Gravian approach to mythology. There are people out there who believe that all mythology, particularly Robert Graves, uh, were based in some form of reality. They were metaphors, every single version of it. Whereas some of us believe I'm more, you know, lenient to the idea that some are metaphors and some are not so metaphorical and they are just like stories, etc. And Helios and Phaeton is a very good example of that. And, and if you're not familiar, here is a brief rundown of that myth. You know, Helios was the god of the sun. He's that chap that used to sit in the horse and chariot and ring his you know little chariot around the world dragging the sun behind him now once upon a time like many of the other gods he was someone that, like mated with some human people down there and one of his human offspring was phaeton now his mother told him that you know you're the son of helios the god but when he told the children at school this other children picked on him a bit like Rudolf and didn't believe him so phaeton took a, a mission to go and find helios himself and confront this god and say like are you actually my father or is my mother pulling my leg so he goes along finds Helios and goes you know hi Helios um I'm Phaeton my mum says that you're my dad but I'm not really sure and Helios is like of course I'm your father do not worry how can I make this up to you I will do anything to prove how much you mean to me as a son and Phaeton's like ha huh, well actually um I enjoy playing with my mum's cart and donkey and I go around the grounds here and there playing around with a wagon and I would actually quite like to upgrade and have a go with your massive 
massive cart and donkey, except actually it's a chariot pulled by loads of horses and drag the sun around the earth. And Helios goes, mm, I would love to, but first, you know, you don't have a driver's license. And secondly, you're not on my insurance. So no chance in hell. So Helios leaves him. Phaeton's a little bit heartbroken, but Phaeton waits until Helios has gone away, sneaks into the chariot, orders the horses to hey-ho, go out the window, and then obviously, as you can imagine, burns to a crisp in the earth as he hits the ground. Now, many people believe that that's a metaphor for comets, and that sounds, you know, pretty feasible. It would be a nice way of explaining why comets hit the earth. In other words, every time there's a comet hit the earth, Helios lets someone else ride the chariot into the earth. But as we know, that's not the case. And me saying that Helios and Phaeton does not exist is not me saying that there's no such thing as the ancients experiencing a comet hitting the earth and then documenting it in some kind of metaphorical stance. And there being no historical relation between Helios and you know, comets and other things. And I say the same about Atlantis, though Atlantis itself is not a direct historical event. It is based on many historical factors. And there have been events that have taken place over history where, you know, parts of land have been consumed by water. I mean, just look at the Doggerlands, for example. There are so many interesting finds and cities that we have lost to water that I would love to explore in this series. But that is not what I'm about today, but I thought it'd be a clarification. So there we go. So as we already covered in episode one, Plato details the story of Atlantis as told by Solon, the sage, to Critias' grandfather when the latter was visiting Egypt. And this story passed all the way down to Critias, who then related to Socrates and then it was documented by Plato. So with this factor in place, many are left wondering if the story truly did originate potentially from Egypt. While there's no direct story of Atlantis from the ancient Egypt, you know, the name of Atlantis is not mentioned anywhere in ancient texts, aside from Plato themselves, from what we found, there are many elements of Atlantis' story which are arguably related to Egyptian background and etymologies. This is not a complete video on all of those, this is just some of them. So let's start with the 9,000 year discussion because that's something that really crops up a lot. When Plato talks about Atlantis, he says that this thing happened 9,000 years ago, but Plato wasn't referring to an accurate timeline. It wasn't as though humans had been able to meticulously count down the past 9,000 years up until that point. And one of the important things many believers of Atlantis overlook is that the ancients didn't have the same accurate carbon dating system that we have today. So calculating an event taking place in 9600 BCE, an event that wouldn't have been documented, considering the earliest known writing wasn't invented until 3400 BCE, over 6000 years later. And even then, it wasn't until another 3000 years after that, that Plato even documented it. So there's a good 9000 years of this event never being physically documented. And this is a puzzle that plays an important role when we analyse the relationship between the Younger Dryas event and Atlantis, which we're covering in another episode entirely. So, where did Plato come up with this number if there wasn't a reliable dating system? Some people think that he overestimated when the Thera eruption happened, and then others believe Plato somehow knew about the devastating meteoric event that took place on the Earth 9,000 years before he existed, despite humanity not being able to write about it for another 6,000 years after the event took place. Is oral tradition really that strong and solid and reliable? I mean, the Aboriginal Australians would have to agree that it is. Or, potentially, was Plato just the first person to ever create a meme? So let's break down these ideas and digest them. Let's figure them out as we go along. First, we have to ask if Plato's 9,000 years are related to the Thera eruption that was responsible to the downfall of the Minoan civilization, which we covered in episode one. The Thera eruption uh, took place circa 1,600 BCE, which is less than 1,200 years before Plato, certainly not 9,000. Now, Plato wasn't silly. I don't think he thought that eruption happened 9,000 years, particularly considering the Egyptians recorded details of the Thera eruption in two locations, arguably. The first of these documentations of the Thera eruption exists on the Tempest Steel, which was erected by Pharaoh Amos I early in the 18th dynasty of Egypt, circa 1550 BCE. Known as the oldest weather report, the Steeler describes a great storm striking Egypt during this time, destroying tombs, temples and pyramids in the Theban region, and the work of restoration ordered by the king. 
Since 2014, many archaeologists, translators and scientists have agreed the destruction detailed on the stela reflects that were expected from the Thera eruption at that time. However, there are others who re recast the stela as hyperbole and believe the stela is little more than propaganda put out by the pharaoh. One of these people is K.S.B. Ryald, who speculated that the very fact the storm should have affected the whole of Egypt, as the stela claims, is itself very improbable. It seems more obvious to regard it as a metaphor, which was perhaps inspired by an actual storm. Reiholt argues that this metaphorical storm is actually the Hyksos invasion. I'll explain that in a minute. All the circumstances for which the storm is blamed are actually events for which the Hyksos can be seen as responsible. But this conclusion ill accords with the specific mention of rain and thunder, which I doubt the Hyksos could control, and it fails to account for the critical fact that the Hyksos are unmentioned, as is any reference to warfare. But Reiholt covers argument to account for this by claiming that there is a reason to believe it was deliberately kept ambiguous. Okay, so for those unfamiliar, the Hyksos were a Semitic people who gained a foothold in Egypt circa 1782 BCE at the city of Avaris in Lower Egypt, thus initiating the era known in Egyptian history as the Second Intermediate Period. They were documented by the Egyptians as invaders who conquered the land, slaughtering without mercy. But archaeological evidence from as recent as 2020 has disproved these claims. In the new study, archaeologist Chris Stantis at Bournemouth University and her colleagues analysed teeth taken from skeletons buried at Avaris to get a clearer picture of who the Hyksos really were. And they found that of the 36 skeletons, 24 were foreign-born, suggesting that the Hyksos rulers were not necessarily foreign-born invaders, but might instead have emerged from centuries-old immigrant communities living in Avaris. Anyway, we've gone slightly off topic. The point is, more archaeologists than not agree that the stela is a literal, not figurative record of a typical thunder and rain, and the resistance to the linkage of this tempest to Thera is motivated less by the text itself and more by the chronological implications of the link concerning Armosa I. As Rittner and Moella explain, for a long time Egyptian chronologies have been established by a means of variety of historical and archaeological sources that offer primarily relative chronological sequences for dynastic Egypt, such as king's lists, monumental records, textual sources and ceramic sequences. Those were then tied to absolute dates by means of a small number of ancient astronomical dates, which come mostly from the Middle and New Kingdoms. The fact that many of these recorded celestial and lunar phenomena occur at irregular intervals has been a promising starting point for establishing several fixed dates within the Egyptian chronology. However, these observations are strongly dependent on the location from which they were made in antiquity, but this information is not clearly stated in the records. Thus, a number of very different dates are technically possible, a fact that adds too many uncertainties and has generated a never-ending discussion amongst scholars. Additionally, radiocarbon dating, a method that generates independent absolute figures, has been frequently criticised in the past because of large margins of error, sometimes between 100 and 200 years. Thus, to overcome this issue, the University of Oxford's Egyptian Chronology Project created a new analytical dating method, which incorporated statistical methods in combination with radiocarbon dates, providing a much more precise data set for the absolute chronology of Egypt. In view of the new date for the Thera eruption and the recent evidence for an older chronological sequence in absolute terms for the New Kingdom and the Middle Kingdom, Amos is currently dated between 30 and 40 years later than the volcanic event. However, as has been shown for the discussion of the Egyptian absolute chronology, the dates for Amos are by no means fully fixed yet. Ritno and Moella thus concludes that, in view of the unusually detailed description of the major climatic event on the Tempest Stela, combined with the shifting chronology, we must now consider the possibility that the Thera eruption had been witnessed by Amos himself. Furthermore, the eruption certainly affected a large part of oral tradition that was fresh in the memory of the people for a long time afterwards. The same can't be said for Atlantis. But the Steeler emphasises the fact that Amos himself witnessed the event, which seems to exclude him using a second-hand account. So that was a long tangent, but you know me, I like to cover my bases. Anyway, what other evidence is there that Egypt documented the Thera eruption? 
Well, according to one researcher, another possible documentation recording the effects of the Pharaoh eruption on Egypt is the London Medical Papyrus, which details six treatments for burns. One treatment describes the contamination of water with ash, four treatments describe the effects of ash on the skin, and the sixth treatment describes the effect of acid rain following the dispersion of ash in the atmosphere, which triggered weather anomalies, all of which were coherent with the Santorini's volcanic fallout. I've linked this paper down below, but I would like to note that whilst his paper is peer-reviewed, he's the only academic I can find discussing the connection between Thera and several Egyptian medical papyri, so handle that topic lightly. All of that was to say that Egypt's documentation of the Thera event may provide us with enough evidence to suggest that Plato wouldn't have been misguided about how long ago the eruption was. After all, even with five different Attic calendars, there was a huge difference between just over a thousand years and nine thousand years, and Plato was intelligent enough to understand this. Okay, so Plato knew Thera didn't happen nine thousand years ago. Plato wouldn't have been able to give an accurate figure in terms of any historical dating, going back over 4,000 years before his time, you know, just due to lack of accurate dating systems and written materials. So why would he have been drawn to the number 9,000? Well, it may be due to the significance of the number 9 in antiquity. From ancient times, numbers represented symbolic ideas, and the interpretation of numbers is one of the oldest symbolic sciences. The Greeks were very preoccupied with the symbolism of numbers, and Plato regarded numbers as the essence of harmony, and harmony as the basis of the cosmos and of man. Pythagoreanism was an influential doctrine, and pure knowledge, Pythagoras argued, was the purification of the soul. Thus, pure essential reality was found only in the realm of numbers. Plato believed that all the data of the senses were merely unsubstantial shadows, and the real world was one of real forms, and the Neoplatonists built their worldview on ideal mathematics. In the Republic, Plato states that the study of the number has an elevating effect on man, as it compels the mind to reason about abstract numbers, and therefore philosophers should also be arithmeticians. So according to Laroche, the number three was the most important Pythagorean, Greek and Roman mystical number, as it represented the synthesis of one and two, and thus solved the conflict posed by dualism, which is why we see the number three playing an important role in ritual and legend. With that in mind, number nine, the tripulation of the triple, was a sacred number feared by the Pythagoreans because of its many surprising qualities, a superstition extending from circa 500 BCE. The number nine is a key symbolic number in Greek myths and an important biblical number. See that Christ also died on the ninth hour. You see, the number nine is often used to symbolize the end of a cycle, the completion of a task, undoubtedly revealing influence from the decimal system of the counting, since a new series always starts after nine. Except, you know, nine, nineteen, twenty-nine, etc. Nine symbolizes truth, since when it is multiplied by any number, it reproduces itself by a mystic addition, and it is associated with the measure of gestations in humans, such as nine months between conception and birth. So we've dissected as much as we can with the 9,000 years. Let's talk about Solon, the figure of Egypt, the man who told Critias' grandfather about Atlantis. Do we have any records of him discussing Atlantis or anything similar? And did Solon even ever visit Egypt, where the conversation apparently took place? As Griffiths writes, quote, Imagination and experience are categories distinct from history, and if the story of Atlantis is placed even in these categories, it does matter whether we can or cannot trust the tradition that Solon went to Egypt and had conversed with the learned priests. So, we do actually hear about Solon's trip to Egypt in much later sources. Plutarch's Life of Solon is a cool one, as you can imagine, and we also hear about it in the treatise of Diogenes Laertius on the lives of philosophers. But, as Griffiths stresses, we have to be, quote, on our guard against the Greek tendency arising from too fervent veneration of Egyptian antiquity to embellish the career of their early philosophers and sages with impressive visits to Egypt. No, this doesn't mean that we have to be so sceptical of his visit and disregard its occurrence entirely, as both Diodoro Siculus who was writing in the 1st century BCE, and Herodotus mentioned Solon's visit to Egypt. According to Herodotus, Solon went to Egypt to the court of Amasis, and borrowed from him the idea of the annual income tax, which he brought to Athens. But to discuss this, we need to discuss our favourite topic of all, 
anachronisms. You see, Solon's archonship is usually dated to 594 BCE, whereas the reign of Amasis did not begin until 570 BCE, 24 years later. Whilst you could argue, well, you know, some scholars would date Solon's legislation much later than his archonship. The issue, however, of anachronism persists and hits us with a double whammy. You see, Herodotus completes his account by claiming that after visiting Egypt and the court of Amasis, Solon went to Sardis, where he consulted King Croesus, who reigned circa 585 to 546 BCE, a reign which didn't start until nine years after Solon introduced income taxes to Athens and started 15 years before the reign of Amasis. However, this double anachronism still doesn't mean that we write off the potential that Solon went to Egypt. But we can't trust Herodotus's word for it. I mean, after all, Herodotus is known for his blunders, the biggest one being his claim that the pharaohs built the pyramids immediately after Ramesses III, when the oldest pyramid, the Step Pyramid, was built for the third dynasty's king, Josea, around 1,444 years before Ramesses III was even born. Anyway... The strongest evidence for Solon's visit to Egypt comes from Solon himself via Plutarch. In the life of Solon, Plutarch quotes a line from one of Solon's poems, which reads, on the Nile's outpourings near the Canopic shore. Plutarch then says Solon spent time with two priests. And it was from then, Plutarch contends, that he Solon heard the story of Atlantis. But we don't have record of this story. But we do have a record of a couple of other stories that Solon will have heard of when he was at Egypt. So the first major story he may have heard was about Ramesses III and the battle against the Sea Peoples. But as Atlantean as that term sounds, um, the, the name Sea Peoples is actually a modern term for the group, not an ancient one. You see, the Sea Peoples were naval warriors who reportedly wrecked havoc upon the Mediterranean between 1400 BCE and 1000 BCE. But their identity and origins are largely shrouded in mystery. Whilst modern scholarship called them the Sea Peoples, the Egyptians actually didn't call them in that term. They identified them as separate groups working together, and they include the following on the screen. I won't want to butcher these names, but these are just some of the groups that they, they talk about. No one knows where they originated. Some believe that they came from Sicily, Sardinia, and Italy, whilst others believe they were part of the Aegean and Western Anatolia, Cyprus, and some even believe they're from the Eastern Mediterranean. From what scholars can tell, they never had one base, they were always moving, but the Egyptians recorded them as having camped in Syria before moving down the coast to the Nile Delta of Egypt. The Sea Peoples left no monuments or records of their own, and everything we know about them comes from inscriptions written by those who battled them, particularly the Egyptians. There are three inscriptions upon the walls of the Medinet Habu Funerary Temple, commemorating and celebrating the military campaigns undertaken by Ramesses III during his reign. These three inscriptions are, one, the Year 5 Libyan War, two, the Year 8 Sea Peoples War, and three, Year 11, the Second Libyan War. These royal inscriptions were written to propagandise and to celebrate Pharaoh's power, and as such, scholars analysing the scripts must be hyper-aware of the use of rhetoric and narratives which reflect traditional ideological or cultural motives rather than realism. So according to the Egyptians, in 1177 BCE, the Sea Peoples attempted to invade Egypt. Ancient images portray one group with feathered headdresses, whilst another faction sported skull caps. Some of them had horned helmets, whilst others were bareheaded. Some had short pointed beards and dressed in short kilts, either bare chested or with a tunic, and others had no facial hair and wore longer garments, almost like skirts. Based on the Egyptian depictions of the Sea Peoples, it would seem that the Sea Peoples were a diverse group of different cultures and geographies binding together for a fight against Egypt. Until this point in history, the Sea Peoples had been undefeated. They'd taken out the Hittites, the Mycenaeans, the Canaanites, and the Cypriots, but they were no match for the Egyptians. And according to the inscription, the Pharaoh states, those who reached my frontier, their seed is not. Their heart and souls are finished forever and ever. Those who come forward together on the sea, the full flame was in front of them at the river mouths, while a stockade of lances surrounded them on the shore. They were dragged in, enclosed, and prostrated on the beach, killed and made into heaps, from tail to head. Their ships and their goods were as if fallen into the water. I have made the lands turn back from 
even mentioning Egypt. For when they pronounce my name in their land, then they are burned up. Max Piper was actually the first scholar who connected the similarities between the story of the Sea Peoples and that of Atlantis. You see, Atlantis is portrayed by Plato as being principally a naval power, and adherents to the Cretan theory find no difficulty in making Minoan Crete play this aggressive role, although there is little historical evidence to support it. Piper allows considerable room in Plato's narrative for the kind of transformation or exaggeration found in the embellishments of poetic or mythic treatment. But Piper refuses to believe that the whole story is pure invention on his part, even if his originality, including a philosophical interpretation, is stamped upon the eventual presentation. Though there isn't a direct account that presents Egypt and Athens as in a, an alliance against a common enemy, the Sayat era pharaohs relied heavily on the help of the Ionian Greeks. Additionally, the Egyptians also worked with the Greeks against the Persians. After the murder of Xerxes, the Egyptian prince Inaros I led a rebellion against the Assyrians during their short-lived occupation of Egypt. Fearing Persian backlash, he invoked the help of the Athenians who assisted him in capturing the larger part of Memphis, and the Athenians came to the Egyptians' aid again when the Persians regained their supremacy in 460 BCE. So this association between the Egyptians and the Athenians and the Persians only deepens the link that we made in episode 1 between the conflict of the Greek and the Persian Empire. In the story of Atlantis we see an alliance between the Greeks and the Egyptians, and once again in history it seems to be the truth but not against Atlanteans, but the Persians. Additionally, these battles with the Sea Peoples were fresh in terms of historical legacy, and a delta city such as Sais might well have preserved the memory of these fearful events with some vividness. So another thing to ask is, is there a connection between an island like Atlantis and Egyptian mythology and history? There's a lot, but I'll touch on some in this video. So let's remind ourselves, firstly, of how Plato described Atlantis, or rather how Solon relayed the description of Atlantis that he was given by the priests. Atlantis was a huge island, bigger than Libya and Asia together, and was positioned opposite the pillars of Heracles, that is, the Straits of Gibraltar today. Plato describes Atlantis as a pinnacle of urban sophistication, wealth, imperial power and technology. What's interesting about Plato's description of Atlantis is that it matches pretty well to how Herodotus describes Ecbatana, the capital of the Median city, and of Babylon under Assyrian rule. Speaking of Deuces, the legendary first king of the Medes and the founder of Ecbatana, Herodotus writes, quote, He built large and strong walls, those which are now called Ecbatana, standing in circles one within the other. And this wall is so contrived that one circle is either higher than the next by the height of the battlements alone. And to some extent, I suppose, the nature of the ground, seeing that it is on a hill, assists towards this end. But much more was it produced by art, since the circles are in all seven in number. And within the last circle are the royal palace and treasure houses. Does this sound familiar to anything about Atlantis going in circular? Whilst Herodotus's depiction is largely fantastical, it is likely an element of truth within it. The story about the Seven Walls has been interpreted as a description of a ziggurat, a multi-storied temple tower that was common in the ancient Near East, but this isn't an interpretation that's set in stone. Unfortunately, because most of the ancient site of Ekbatana has been overbuilt by modern Hamadan, archaeological understandings of this ancient city are pretty damn limited. When it comes to Herodotus' depiction of Babylon, well, it's effectively nonsensical. <laughs> he wanted us to believe that the walls of Babylon were 100 metres high and 22 kilometres long, and that there were 100 bronze gates giving access to the city. However, one thing of note is Herodotus' depiction of the city's embankments uh, is pretty interesting. He says, Large as these structures are, behind all of them are huge pits sunk deep into the ground to take water off the river when in spate. For when its level has exceeded the top of the embankment, the flood would sweep away city buildings if there were no drain shafts and cisterns to siphon it off. This was quite a hot take in the, in the day, um, but historian Edward Gibbons read about this section and quoted and remarked that Herodotus had clearly never stepped foot in Babylon, and that was really controversial back then, but that's actually come to be largely agreed upon <laughs> by historians today. So what you probably noted in the first Herodotus extract was the concentric circles of the city walls of great size and strength, rising in circles one within the other, and different colours of material are said to have been used. 
There are many other concentric circles throughout history and ancient texts and architecture to analyse regarding Atlantis and the potential source for inspiration. That we will have to save for another video, so for now let's focus on how Egypt may have inspired some of the Atlantean imagery. So let's start with our favourite school topic when we enter this, irrigation. So first let's look at the irrigation that we just touched on in Herodotus's Babylonian description. The large plain of Atlantis is described by Critias as being irrigated by a complex system of channels or canals, one series running north to south and another providing cross channels. A feature of this system is said to be the use of transport by water, including the floating of timber from the mountains and also the movement of agricultural produce. But fertilising power was the main goal. Big river valleys of either Egypt or Mesopotamia could have very easily have provided the model for such irrigation of Atlantis. But the complexity and the regularity of the system favours more Egyptian analogies. After referring to the fiery disaster which attended the attempt made by Phaeton, child of the sun, who drives his father this chariot, the Egyptian priest tells Solon. For us, however, the Nile is in general our saviour and saves us from this disaster when its flow is released. Griffiths explains how the Nile inundation occurs in the hot season and the release of its flow probably includes a reference to the use of plant irrigation. A little later, the priest tells Solon that in Egypt, water never falls on the land from above but rises up naturally from below. A clear reference to the general absence of rain and the fertilising power of the river. The irrigation process also meant that the dangers of flooding could be mitigated in Egypt. Whilst all this is true for Egypt, is it also the true for the Atlantis theory? We have seen that the description of the capital city and its concentric water rings seems to derive from what Herodotus says about the Persian and Babylonian capitals. You know, Plato states that a canal in Atlantis connected the outer ring of water with the sea. And this would scarcely suit either Ecbatana or Babylon. And it wouldn't actually apply to any pre-Alexandrian Egyptian city either. So that's a bit of a mystery, really, there. Now, let's talk about Egyptian and Atlantean politics. Plato's Atlantis is a holy island by virtue of Poseidon. Poseidon had five pairs of male twins, and the island of Atlantis was distributed into ten parts for each son to become rulers over each region, thus making the first rulers of Atlantis divine in origin. And the blissful society which developed from there is reflective of Hesiod's portrait of the golden race. This blissful divine rule of Atlantis mirrors the Egyptian tradition, which envisaged the primitive era of happiness as one when the gods ruled amongst men as the earliest kings. Remember what Plato said about concerning the governing of Atlantis? Atlantis combined monarchical rule with regional autonomy. Yes, it was divided into ten parts and each was ruled by one of Poseidon's five sets of twins, but one was also a king who ruled all. If we're looking for a parallel ancient political system, we don't need to look further than ancient Egypt itself. Although the power of the pharaoh in the capital city was strong, Egypt was divided into gnomes, and each had its own nomarch. Atlantis had one king and nine regional rulers. There's that magic number nine again. However, the system of the nomarchs in Egypt isn't as uniform, and as Griffiths says, even if Plato was inspired by Egypt's nomarchical system, he produced for Atlantis a highly systemized blueprint, which did not exactly correspond to any historical reality. Atlantis' political system is likely the culmination of many systems that combined strong centralism with a measure of delegated power, such as the division of the Persian Empire, but Atlantis, like Egypt, wasn't an empire, and the divisions were made within the country. However, the role of the ten rulers of Atlantis relates more to the structure of Egypt than anywhere else. Herodotus discusses how Egypt was divided into 12 districts and 12 kings over them who vowed to respect each other's positions of power. Likewise, Plato's 10 rulers are described as having agreed to a non-aggression pact, though one king rules supreme. The 12 rulers of Egypt, according to Herodotus, pour libations together in the temple of Hephaestus. In Egypt, though, it would have been Patafuta. Very similar to the extract in Herodotus's histories about the Egyptians pouring libations, um, Plato's Atlanteans rulers also do this, only their libations are to Poseidon rather than Hephaestus. In fact, if you were to take this episode of Egypt by Herodotus and place it alongside Plato's description of Atlantean politics, they're disappointingly similar. Plato is normally pretty original, uh, but this was clearly his weak point. There are many crossovers here in the pattern and organisation. There were so many other things I could have discussed in this video. We could have discussed 
I want to discuss the origin mythology of Egypt and how that relates. Also the shipwrecked sailor, which is an ancient Egyptian story about a sailor who finds himself a magical island that's ruled by a divine golden snake. Um, and that's a whole thing in of itself. And the similarities between that and the Atlantean story as well. But I've already gone on long enough. This was a hefty, hefty research video. And I, again, as I said, I have linked everything down below. Thank you Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. Also, thank you to my patrons because you are really, really pulling it. I cannot thank you enough. I'd also like to thank everyone who supports me on my second channel as well and joins in with the live streams when we discuss these topics more in person. And yes, I can only apologize. I am very, very hot. I, this took a long time for me to research and I hope you enjoyed episode two. It, it was a lot, there was a lot in here and I hope it was at least enjoyable and interesting. I found all the facts that I found pretty interesting as well. And if there's anything you want me to specifically cover in the next episode, please do let me know. But I think I may take a wee bit of a break from Atlantis, do some other ancient research uh, out there because I'm, I'm interested in Greek mythology again. So I'd like to go back to there. So if there's anything you'd like me to discuss in an upcoming video, please leave your topic down below. And thank you so much for watching today's video. I hope you are happy and healthy. And remember, books save lives, so keep reading.